Okay. Hi. Uh, this video is probably for 412, 415. Um, today's Monday, March 22nd. Um, and, or if you were absent, you're going to be watching this video. Uh, so I had to head off to a doctor's appointment. So that's why I'm making you guys this lesson video. Okay. So, uh, today you guys are going to be learning about the phonations, which is kind of a new, it's a new topic, but it is connected to Egypt. So let's get started. I am going to share my screen and get moving here. All right, so we're gonna start off by having everybody go over to Google Classroom. I'm just gonna click on 412 because those are the first people who are gonna be watching this video. We're gonna be opening up the assignment called Phonations, and we are going to be opening up two things to start class off today. One, we're gonna open up the document in your work. Uh, it's called Classwork and Notes for Lesson 2.4 Phonations. And I'm gonna have you guys open up this video. So when you open up those two tabs, remember, feel free to pause this video and do what you've gotta do and then hit play when you're ready for the next set of instructions. I'm gonna have you guys start off with this do now up at the top. So based on your observations from a video you're about to watch, and a picture on page 80 that I'm gonna go over in a second. What was Phoenicia most known for? And this is for uh, three points. So what was Phoenicia known most for? So take a look at this image right here on um, it's page 80 of our textbook. And I'm gonna have this read out loud to you. Phoenician ship. The Phoenicians sailed their ships in the Mediterranean and beyond. Through trade, the Phoenicians also had contact with Mesopotamia. They established colonies or outposts of people from one land who live in another land, in places as far away as Spain. Phoenicia's most famous colony was Carthage in North Africa. Right here. Press each area to learn more. I was going to tell them that. Okay. So these little red lines that we see here are their trade routes or their travel routes. The Phoenicians came from a land just a little bit northeast of Egypt where we were studying. I'll show you that in the Google Earth in a second. And um, they would have these amazing boats that had these huge, large sails. Large sail. The use of sail power and wind made it possible for ships to carry large cargoes without needing a lot of rowers. So in the video you're about to watch, you're going to see how these boats work. Nobody else in the ancient world had these types of boats. And because of that, they were able to sail faster, farther, and on rougher seas with bigger waves. They had a safer boat. Take a look at this. Deck. The Phoenicians constructed space beneath the deck where they could store cargo and supplies for the crew. So here's some of their cargo. We see a lot of these goods right down here. Goods. Slaves loaded such goods as wood, wine, and papyrus onto the ship. Wait, papyrus from Egypt. These people were importers and exporters. I'm going to teach you about that in a video in just a second. Over here, what do we have? Ballast. Ballast. Stones lining the bottom of the ship were used as ballast or something that provides stability for sailing in rough waters. So when you put weight at the bottom of a boat, especially a boat like this, like a nice wide bottom boat like this, um, when you put weight, it's going to stop it from swaying back and forth so much. If you have a boat that has kind of like a V-shaped hull or the bottom of a boat is called a hull, you're going to be able to tip that boat a little bit easier in bigger waves. These boats were designed to be out in the heavy, heavy, heavy seas. So the ballast or the weight in the bottom of the boat kept it from turning over so much. Is that right, Ellie? Is that right? Yeah. So one last thing to discover on this page. Figurehead. The ship's wooden figurehead was often carved into the shape of a horse's head. The eyes were meant to help the ship see where it was heading. Right? I want a horse head, not a cat head. So taking a, a look at this, you might have to look back, maybe pause the video, rewind it, or maybe go open up this PDF on your um, assignment. Taking a look at this page, as well as, give me a second, I gotta move windows around, um, as well as, now the cat's biting my hand. What lovely, Ellie. 
So taking a look at this page and this video, the Phoenicians. Off the coast. You can go ahead and watch that one on your own. Um, watching this video and that page that I just had read out loud to you, I want you guys to go ahead and go do your do now right now. So pause this video and go do your do now. Reminder that your do now is based on the observations from the video and the image on page 80, what was Phoenicia most known for? So based on this picture and this video, so go watch this video, this one right here, the five minute video. Go answer that question at the top. Pause this video. The one right there. So we'll switch videos. Okay, welcome back. All right, so now that you have done your do now and you have written at the top of your document what you think the Phoenicians were known most for, now it's time to read and take some notes. That's what we're going to do in class, okay? So let's go ahead. I'm going to open this. I'm going to make this big and large and in charge again. So today we're going to read about a trading people. We are only going to read this first main idea, this first section called a trading people. We'll save the second part for tomorrow's class. So a trading people. A narrow strip of coast along the eastern Mediterranean contained or had many natural resources and had good harbors. I'm going to stop for a second. I'm going to show you guys a little bit of Google Earthing. So we just finished up our study on Egypt over here, Nile River, learning about um, pharaohs and pyramids and cataracts and gods and goddesses and all of that fun stuff. Now we've moved just a little bit further northeast to a land called Phoenicia. Phoenicia is in present day Lebanon, which is right over here. But I've dropped all these little, um, I've dropped all these like little locations, these red dots for all the major ancient ruins or places that we can still see today of ancient Phoenicia. So Phoenicia was located right on a coast, on the, on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And because of those boats that you just saw in that video, and because of those boats that you saw in our textbook page, these boats here, they were able to sail across the Mediterranean Sea way better than anybody else of their day. In fact, they were able to take over certain lands or colonize certain lands uh, like Carthage, like right here in Northern Africa, because they needed a place to pull over that was safe for them. If you were to pull over an enemy territory, you were sure to be killed. So they needed to colonize or take over or make friends with faraway lands um, so that way they could be able to park their boats, rest, and get more sources, um, get more supplies for their boat. But because their boats were so amazing, they were able to sail out through Gibraltar. So Gibraltar is, it's called the Straits of Gibraltar right here. And let me tell you something about the waves in the Straits of Gibraltar. Straits of Gibraltar, you need a legit boat to get through here. You've got the force of the Atlantic Ocean pushing in to the Mediterranean Sea. You've got the force of the Mediterranean Sea pushing back against the Atlantic Sea. And it funnels right here in this tiny little strip of water. And you get these waves that go just like through this area, you need a boat that won't tip over. You need a boat that has a sail that can switch and take charge of these winds that are coming down from Spain and up from Africa. You need to know what you're doing to get through the Straits of Gibraltar. And that's what the Phoenicians did. So the Phoenicians could sail out through the Straits of Gibraltar and they were able to sail and go to lands that people in the ancient world had not yet discovered. So I've got this little locator dropped here for Phoenicia. They would sail through the Mediterranean Sea, out through the Straits of Gibraltar, and they were able to go and explore lands that were cut off by the Sahara Desert. So they were exporting and importing, we'll talk about those words in a second, they were exporting and importing things that people had never seen before. They were bringing their stuff to people who needed or had never seen their things before, like cedar trees or purple dye fabrics. We'll talk about that in a second. So, well, I'm going back to the text. 
back in here. So this should make a little bit more sense now. The narrow strip of coastline on the eastern side or the eastern coast of the Mediterranean had many natural resources. Let's go break that word down. Natural resources right here. So if you want to pause this video right here to go take these notes, that's probably a really good idea. So the two main natural resources that Phoenicia had were, and we'll talk about those in a second, but what is a natural resource? It's a nature. So natural means nature and resource means something we use. So to break it down, it's something we use from nature, something we use from nature. Okay. Trees. That's mother nature made trees. Um, waters from the river. That's a natural resource. You guys just did an assessment where you learned about gold mining um, in Pueblo, Mexico, or silver mining. I think it was both metals. Gold and silver are a natural resource that people want to use from Mother Nature. Okay, So a natural resource is something we use from nature. Now we're going to go hunt in the text right now. What are the two natural resources that are used in Phoenicia? The narrow strip of coast between the Eastern Mediterranean contained many natural resources and had good harbors. This combination was perfect for the development of industry and trade. About 1000 BC, independent city-states emerged or popped up in this area. They shared cultural similarities, including language and a trading economy. The Greeks called the people from these city-states the Phoenicians, which meant purple dye people. The Phoenicians process or use um, a local shellfish or a fish with a shell, like a crab or a snail, something like that, um, into purple dyes. So that's why we see fabric over here or purple dye packages. Um, people all over the world did not have this color on their fabric. They did not see this color in their nat in their natural environment. So they were willing to pay a lot of money. For the purple fabric or the purple dye and that's why the color purple is associated with the royal class or the really up there um rich social class because they could afford to import or to buy that purple dye from the phoenicians they exported wood. So we're going to talk about exports and we're going to talk about imports. Don't you bite me. We're going to talk about exports and we're going to talk about imports. Okay. So this dye was their most famous trade. Good. They exported wood from their highly desired cedar trees. Do you remember in ancient Egypt, we learned about how they used cedar oil to mummify with, and they also used the cedar tree to uh, build their, um, their coffins or their homes with, because they didn't have wood that they could build with. So they would have to import, oh, you see wood. They would have to import it from places like Phoenicia. And cedar was really good because it had a smell that would keep the bugs away. I wonder if it keeps cats away too. So it would keep the bugs away. So if I had cedar oil and I was mummifying with it, it would keep the bugs away. And uh, cedar trees have a smell that keep the bugs away as well. Okay, they exported wood from their highly desired cedar trees to Egypt and Mesopotamia. From other lands, they imported or bought or brought in, 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 in import, uh, raw materials or substances from which other things are made. Phoenician artisans crafted these materials into luxury goods. Now, this last paragraph is all about the alphabet. We'll talk about that in a second. So let's go over to our notes and two main natural resources that Phoenicia had was the purple dye from their shellfish or their snails that live in the water and their cedar trees. So those are two very important things that nature gave to the Phoenicians that other people wanted to buy from them. So take these notes right now. You might want to pause the video. Next, export means export. I'm going to break it down over here. Export means, and it's got the root in it, EX, exit, to leave, export, exit, to leave. 
So exit or export means goods that are being shipped out or leaving the country to make money, to sell, okay? So export means to ship goods out of the country to sell and make money off of it. Import means to bring goods into the country or you're buying them because you don't have them. So if I was Egypt, I would be buying cedar trees, importing them, in, 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 in. I like to use this root word, import, bringing in goods from another country or buying them from another country. So let's take those notes on export and import. Remember to pause this video so you can type. And then the last bullet we're gonna do is describing the Phoenician alphabet. So when you're ready, press play on this video to talk about the alphabet. Hi, okay, <laughs> if you're like watching it, that was like super weird. So last paragraph here. Phoenicia's most important export was its culture, language, food, beliefs. Um, to record trade transactions, the Phoenicians used their own 22 letter alphabet, which was adapted or changed from Sumerians in Mesopotamia, from their cuneiform, if you remember learning about that, from their cuneiform. Oh, shush. Each symbol from the Phoenician alphabet stood for a sound, like k, at, cat. Oh, she's fun today. So we've got C, A, T, cat, K, A, T, cat. So that's our alphabet, okay? So our alphabet is one letter or symbol, one sound. K is the letter C. A is the letter A. T is the letter T, okay? One letter, one sound, or one symbol, one sound. The Sumerians came up with that. I mean, no, 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 just kidding. I said Sumerians. Phoenicians came up with that. Okay. Oh my gosh. Shush. Okay. Um, each symbol from the Phoenician alphabet stood for a sound. <coughs> First, the ancient Greeks adopted or brought the Phoenician alphabet. Then the ancient Romans modified or changed it uh, to form the basis of modern Western alphabet. So right now we're going to go back into our notes and we're going to take down some notes on describing the Phoenician alphabet. It was a way to write down exactly what you are saying word for word because each sound can make up a word. So if I want to say, how was your day, how, I can sound out that word that I want to write down. It was a way to write down exactly what you're saying. We're not writing in pictures anymore like the Egyptians. Hieroglyphics are the old way. They are out. Writing in hieroglyphics, out. We've got a better way, the Phoenicians said. It's a 22 symbol alphabet, one symbol, one sound. So this picture that I have here in my notes comes from your assignment. So here in the assignment in Google Classroom, we've got the textbook page, your document, the video from the do now and the Phoenician alphabet. So I'm going to end this video here. I want to see you by the end of class today. Uh, you should have completed your do now and you should have completed these notes for a trading people. Total eight points up for grabs for class today. Thanks.